As found in the case studies, tribal nations in what is currently called the United States are comprehensive and clearly outlined documents which prioritize which species are most at risk and vulnerable to the changes which will affect those tribal nations' self-determination and cultural integrity. There are also strategies for adaptation that include knowledge sovereignty and the exchange of traditional knowledge. As we can see, experiencing repercussions from climate change related to issues causes responses from indigenous peoples faster than other detached cultures and nations. This is another way in which indigenous peoples are leading the way in climate change adaptation. By refusing to forget their culture and traditions, they take a stand to remember that human agency can be used to benefit the world. Moving towards the future, there is a call to decolonize the Anthropocene and re-indigenize the future in order to heal the rift in time. Movements come in many shapes and forms. Some are large, others small. Some are slow, others fast. Some are planned and others are seemingly spontaneous. The movements that are broadcast on the media tend to be the ones that are large, occur relatively fast, and are seemingly spontaneous. In terms of climate change and tribal nations, the most recent of these movements are the Dakota Access Pipeline protests and 30-meter telescope protests at Mauna Kea. As these movements draw attention to issues indigenous peoples are facing, they are not isolated events and are expressions of the greater ones bubbling up below the surface. An example of one of these is the initiation by tribal nations to decolonize aspects of their lives and experiences. This kind of movement is relatively slow, it's planned, and starts very small, beginning with an individual choosing to decolonize their own choices. One can decolonize their diets by choosing to eat foods that are native to the land they are on. One can decolonize their gender normative mindsets by supporting genderqueer and two-spirit identities, as well as non-monogamous relationships. One can decolonize their spending by supporting indigenous-owned businesses and also decolonized economies by choosing alternatives to money by swapping goods and services. One can decolonize their education by reading and listening to indigenous scholars, thinkers, and artists. And one can decolonize the environmental movement and climate change adaptation and mitigation through supporting indigenous-initiated policies and programs and supporting indigenous sciences. For centuries, Western science has been thought of as the only legitimate science. This has led to a form of colonial epistemology, or theory of knowledge. Through the efforts of many indigenous peoples and allies working to have traditional knowledges recognized alongside Western science, it was only recently that the two seemingly opposite ways of viewing the world have overlapped in quantum mechanics, ecology, and climate change studies. There is consensus that the more ways we have of viewing the truth, the better. So highlighting traditional science is fundamental to seeing the truth. One thing to note is that traditional knowledges are not static. They cannot be isolated from the context in which they are understood, which is in direct connection to the land and waters in which it is learned. In this case, traditional knowledges become vulnerable to climate change as they are extensions of the ecosystem. When the environment changes, so does the knowledge. Traditional knowledges stand as the access point to connect to the people who have been stewarding the land and waters, a sort of time machine to bridge the past and present to the future. There are traditional knowledges of governance, calendar, and phonology systems showing ceremonies, plantings, and seasonal harvests, a living calendar which moves and adapts to its changing environment. Traditional knowledge is intertwined with language. Just like the death cap mushroom and the delicious bolete, a name tells characteristics, edibility, when they grow, and other useful information. Kinship and trade systems show just how interdependent tribal nations are to one another. How damage of coastal resources affects the whole web of connected tribes. Food sovereignty is the freedom to grow, gather, share, and eat what you want to. And likewise, food knowledge is a connection to the land, water, ancestors, tradition, health, and well-being. Within traditional knowledge, there is an incorporated system of ethics which helps to maintain this resilience. Reciprocation between people to people and non-human beings is intrinsic. In terms of sharing traditional knowledges with non-knowledge holders, trust is a core element of this exchange. A side effect of a colonial system is that they often misappropriate, misuse, lose the specificity and context, and end up stealing traditional knowledge, an act known as biopiracy. For these reasons, amongst others, there is a need to naturalize indigenous knowledge as a part of re-indigenizing futures. Colonial narratives have perpetuated the myths that indigenous peoples and cultures are gone, a thing of the past. There are 573 federally recognized tribes in the U.S. and Alaska, 245 federally non-recognized tribes, and many tribes who have been lumped together, so that number is a lot higher. Many of these tribes have an environmental department and are working on climate change-related issues every day.
Tribal nations are using tribal law to move past federal environmental laws, functionally acting as climate change adaptation and mitigation laboratories, where we can see on a smaller scale how climate change initiatives turn out. There are intertribal declarations on climate change, tribal environmental justice groups, conventions, summits, symposiums on climate change. There are tribal law and treaty rights that focus on environmental issues and tribal youth-led climate change education. Counter to the narrative, a lot of work is being done, and it's important to recognize this work to plan appropriately. Many indigenous scholars studying climate change call for community-based research, community participation, and culturally specific interventions as they are necessary to improve community health. New areas for study intend to understand more on the impacts of climate change, such as the movement of culturally important species off of reservations or trust lands. The recognition of current research being performed by tribal nations, also to work to ensure that the use of traditional knowledge and climate change initiatives protects the intellectual property of tribes. There's a call to honor treaties for tribal youth leadership to increase indigenous resilience to climate change by increasing federal support for communities as they prepare, and to recognize other sciences along with a tribal review board to ensure intellectual property rights. Tribes are the third sovereignty. It's federal, state, and tribal. Land and waters management needs to be returned to the people who have been stewards of these resources for millennia. When we restrict indigenous peoples and their practices of resiliency, we damage everything which is connected to them in the web of interdependence. In terms of revisiting this moment in the time spiral, we need to return differently. The word apocalypse has Greek roots, which translates to becoming uncovered or to reveal. This apocalypse is also revealing how we have been behaving in the past, how we have been marginalizing the environment and those closest to it. Assuming that time is not actually linear, in order to create a future narrative of indigenous futurism, we must alter our narrative of the past at the same time. By continuing to behave in the same pattern which our colonial ancestors passed down, we deny our own human agency. We continue to be a cancerous influence on the environment and to one another. However, there is another way. Together, we can shift our values as we recognize the true value of what is already here. Colonial narratives consistently place indigenous peoples in the past, without technology and on the brink of being forgotten. Indigenous science fiction writers and artists are challenging this narrative. Molly Swain on the podcast Matisse in Space says, Armed with spirit in the teaching of our ancestors, all our relations behind us, we are living the indigenous future. We are the descendants of a future imaginary that has already passed, the outcome of the intentions, resistance, and survivance of our ancestors. Simultaneously in the future and past, we are living in the dystopian now. By living in the dystopian now, by facing it with courage, we give context to the past and are given the chance to gesture towards an intentional future. By decolonizing our mindset, we can begin to see the interconnections between ourselves, one another, and the environment, and begin to start behaving as if those connections truly matter. By seeing the wholeness of time, rather than just its linear tendencies, we can see how our stories are interwoven with the stories of those who came before us and those who are yet to come.